All righty. Today, it's my pleasure to chat with Professor Kerry Ressler of Harvard. He's a um, professor of psychiatry. So he's got both an MD and a PhD. He's a professor of psychiatry, chief scientific officer, McLean Hospital, uh, where he's chief of the division of depression and anxiety disorders. He's a leading expert on research in both humans and animals on post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety, related disorders, and that's what he's going to inform us about today. Uh, Kerry, why don't you start off? I know, like in the laboratory, we use mice and rats a lot, and if you expose them to an odor from a cat, for example, I, I think urine from a cat, they will exhibit kind of innately a fear response, and this actually harkens back to your PhD work with uh, Linda Buck on the olfactory system, right? Uh, and of course, during evolution, there's a lot of animals where olfaction, it's, it's probably the most ancient sense. So you do want to talk a little bit about evolutionary perspective on fear and its adaptive value? Sure. Well, first of all, thanks, Mark, for having me here today. I really look forward to the discussion. Um, so yeah, there's a, a lot of questions kind of buried in there. We could, I could probably talk for a solid hour on what you've already started, but I'll give a few a few points. Um, first of all, obviously, um, you know, evolution is driven by survival, and you know the most, you know, the 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 sort of joke is that you know the the most critical survival instincts are the the um, the F's: um, fighting, fleeing, feeding, and copulating. <laughs> and, and, um, so we study, you know, the, 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 the fight or flight response, you know, which is the classic fear response when, when an animal um, senses danger, how it, how it survives. And part of that is through innate um, mechanisms that both we are built into our genome and the way our brain is organized. And some of the examples you gave where animals, including humans, you know, are innately fearful of some things, um, and particularly in rodents, um, it seems that they can be innately fearful of certain kinds of predator odors or senses. Um, you know, the most um, common thing is um, that's innately fearful is is some anything that activates the pain system. Um, and um, so when we start to talk about learned fear and how we then build associations and build sort of an associative network of what's what in the world is fearful and what is safety as one develops, um, you know, a lot of that is what caused me pain or caused me, um, you know, direct threat. And then everything that is associated with those begins to be fearful in and of itself as well. And that's the way our brains have evolved so that we relatively quickly, we, you know, one trial learning is all you need um, to be afraid of a lion or, you know, not touching the stove, et cetera. And that's because um, if it takes more than one trial, you probably won't survive to pass your genes on to the next generation. <laughs> and then, um, but, but typically, you know, an animal or a human will recover from, from a threat. And however, in some cases, the the threat is so severe, or I guess repeated exposures to a threat uh, can lead to long term problems, which is PTSD is one such problem. And then, right. So being afraid alone, you know, is 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 not pathological at all. It's healthy. Right. Um, and this fear system, and, and I didn't really comment on the olfactory component, but you know, as you mentioned in rodents. Um, in particular, the olfactory system is both the oldest, you know, in many ways, sensory system in mammals and um, is most tied into what we call the limbic system. It turns out that the, the olfactory bulbs, the first part of the brain that receives sensory information from, from the smell, go, projects directly into the amygdala, whereas all other sensory systems project through the thalamus. So they have an extra way station before they go to the amygdala. Um, and that's, we think, part of the reason yeah. why olfactory information, um, as Proust said, you know, Proust is that, you know, it's basically directly emotional. It brings back all these memories. It's tied directly into the memory system. Um, and it also is tied directly into the fear system. Um, so I think that's one of the reasons why it's such a, a robust fear cue. But again, most fear in most species is not pathological at all. It's basically how you learn what is safe in the environment and to be able to navigate the world around us. Um, 
And um, in contrast, some of our psychiatric disorders, um, particularly um, the anxiety disorders um, with the most specific uh, post-traumatic stress disorder are disorders in which the fear system seems to get be unregulated or, or dysregulated and no longer is one able necessarily after a severe enough trauma um, and we, we could, we'll get into it. We think that you know the, the, the risk for who develops PTSD versus who doesn't following a trauma is multiple fold, partly biological and genetic, partly experiential, partly psychological. Um, but you know most people after anything fearful, touching a stove, being chased by a lion, getting you know being af afraid of a bully or whatever, you, you recover. Um, but whether you have enough traumas over time or they happen at particular times during development or you have you know, enough risk, then they can start to shift to where they then be fear begins to rule one's life and safety becomes unattainable. And that's where you start to get into the anxiety disorders and PTSD. Um, so clinically, um, so I was watching, I'm kind of a big George Carlin fan. <laughs> And I don't know if you saw, he had this little piece on PTSD where he starts out saying, well, he used to call it shell shock. And that's two syllables. And, and that would go, so what, what's uh, historically from a psychiatrist perspective and, and the collection of psychiatrists who sort of define these disorders, how did that kind of evolve and what's the current definition and, and way to, to clinically diagnose someone. Yeah, great. So I haven't seen the Carlin piece. I'll have to watch it. It sounds entertaining and, and informative, perhaps. <laughs> but but as, as you pointed out, um, the concept of people being changed significantly in how they interact with the world after trauma is not a new concept. It exists in the ancient Greek and Roman literature. And it sounds like as long as there have been people being traumatized, yeah. um, there have been people who've experienced these kinds of symptoms. And certainly that was noted um, from ancient battle um, and fires and things like that, where people would be haunted by these memories and never the same again, and not being able to interact with people the same way, kind of huddled in a corner or always wanting to fight or whatever. And a lot of those anecdotes have been told over history. Um, and then come, you know, concepts like battle fatigue and, and, and war neurosis and shell shock um, and many other terms um, through really the civil war and through the world wars, um, you know, continued to be recognized. Um, it was first really became part of the modern psychiatry lexicon with DSM-3 in the 1970s after the Vietnam War. Um, and that was partly um, in response to the anti-war movement that really became more of, of um, recognizing that this was not an inert thing, putting people in battle and having them shoot at other, other people or shoot at civilians. This is, or be watching their friends get shot or being maimed themselves. In fact, it could change people forever long beyond the physical injury. Um, and so um, it became more, after with DSM, it was sort of formalized in that way. And then with the women's rights movements in the 70s um, and much more appreciation of the effects of sexual assault and the unspoken um, history, of course, you know, Freud first started talking about women's trauma in the 1800s, and then it kind of was not talked about again for you know, a long time, and then in the, in the women's rights movement. But, but that really kind of what led to the more appreciation that this happens in civilians as well. Um, and the, the diagnosis um, in the, with DSM-3, that has not changed that much over the last 30 or 40 years, when now we're in DSM-5, um, is that number one, one has to experience, have experienced the life-threatening trauma, um, and um, we can talk about the, that's called the criterion A trauma and the, some of the, con the controversies in the field about experiencing versus witnessing and what is sufficient trauma to count. But one has to have experienced a trauma that most people would say, yes, this is a very severe out of the ordinary trauma. And then they have several cl clusters of symptoms. The classic ones are intrusive um, memories and thoughts. And basically this is what we think of classically as a flashback. People feel like they're re-experiencing the memory, the trauma in real time, and they can't dis distinguish necessarily even what's real and what's not in that moment. Or the intrusive nightmares, waking up at night, continuing to revisit that trauma over and over again in one's dreams and not sleeping well. Um, then, um, avoidance of, um, of people, places, and things, and reminders and cues that remind one of the trauma. And that can happen very extensively and um, often becomes the biggest aspect 
of dysfunction for people. They'll start by maybe not going to the part of town where they had the car accident or were attacked, but then they don't want to go out at night anymore. And then they don't want to be around men and then they can't leave their house. And then they can't leave their bedroom because the world has become less and less safe, more and more dangerous. And they're avoiding everything around them and they're avoiding relationships and work, et cetera. And then the other um, classic is hyperarousal. And this is increased startle responses, um, in decreased sleep, always feeling on edge, never feeling safe. The, adrenergic system constantly being revved up, um, sweating, all of those sorts of physiological hyperarousal. And then the most current, new, the new symptom, the set of symptoms that moved from DSM-4 to DSM-5 in the last 10 years was adding, um, recognizing um, that, that cognition is very much impaired and that, that there's a long history of PTSD being comorbid with depression. So having more depressive symptoms that aren't just depression alone, but are directly related to the PTSD and trauma and having dysfunction, decreased executive functioning, decreased concentration and cognition, all because of the trauma memories that are constantly bombarding a person. So to recap briefly, criterion A, having experienced trauma, B, um, intrusive thoughts, C, avoidance, D, um, cognition and depression, and E, um, flashback, I mean, hyperarousal. Yeah. Uh, let's, um, let's see, what should we talk about next? Let's go on and, and talk about some of the human studies you've been involved with, and then we'll go to the circuitry in the brain, which, you know, you've done some nice work with imaging studies now. Uh, and then circle back to the animal studies where one can really interrogate the brain at more <laughs> refined level. Sure. Um, so the work, um, I guess, two things that I didn't finish off on the diagnosis that then can lead into some of the human work we've done um, is the length of time. So um, one has to have it, one has to have ex be experiencing these symptoms at least a month after the trauma. And the first month we call acute stress disorder. And then if it's a month or later, it's chronic, it's PTSD or then chronic PTSD. Um, and the reason that is because most people in the acute aftermath of trauma will have numbness, will not sleep well, will feel um, in shock, will um, want to avoid. But again, most people recover. Um, and so after any given trauma, about 90% of people will recover and they may have a bad memory, but they don't go on to develop a sort of black hole of emotional memory that we call PTSD. And so that acute stress period is to capture that large percentage of people who actually recover over time. Um, and then, um, then one has to have symptoms for at least a two week period. So those are the other criteria. The, while we're, how does that fit in with the work we've done over the years? So. Um, in terms of um, the question of, of civilian versus military and understanding chronic PTSD, our work began about 20 years ago um, at Grady Hospital in Atlanta, and um, we went on to call it the Grady Trauma Project. And the observation there when I was a resident um, was that um, while I'd had exp I was very interested in, in, in in trauma and anxiety, actually, if we, when we talk about the animals, really my training was first as a neuroscientist and I was really looking for a circuit that I could focus my physician scientist career on that was relevant to both an animal model approach and a clear human condition. Um, and so understanding the amygdala and the fear system um, with my work with Mike Davis was very intriguing to me. And so, okay, then in the late nineties, I was like, well, what can I do that we know about the amygdala? So clearly the spectrum of anxiety disorders, but in particular post-traumatic stress and the association of fear learning, fear conditioning, um, and then you know trauma as a very robust fear process. So I um, was trained as most people are at the VA in understanding PTSD in the military cohorts, which was very interesting. Um, but also then as a resident began seeing as I was aware of, of trauma and PTSD, as we, as I would say, you know, be at the psychiatric emergency room in downtown Atlanta and Grady's the main um, trauma receiving facility for most of Northeast Georgia, um, you'd see everything, right? So you'd see a lot of first break psychosis, you'd see an enormous amount of substance abuse, you'd see people in the jails. Um, and we diagnosed a lot of schizophrenia and bipolar and depression. The reality is everybody seemed to kind of have everything. <laughs> But what we weren't diagnosing was much was PTSD. And um, so, so first of all, my first thought was, 
either I was a really awful diagnostician or DSM was sort of a fantasy because, <laughs> because at least most people in, in um, complex environments have or don't, or don't fit neatly within most of our DSM criteria. But the flip side of that was everybody seemed to be affected by trauma and we weren't paying attention to it, um, in our, particularly in our under-resourced, impoverished um, inner city communities. Um, and so, you know, really began to think about trauma more like, you know, almost like syphilis was thought about in the 1800s as sort of the great mimicker that could look a little bit like everything because trauma can be a risk factor for depression, a risk factor for psychosis, a risk factor certainly for substance abuse. Um, and so there was a lot of trauma related disorders and a lot of PTSD that we weren't looking at um, just from people's lives in the inner city, from, from neighborhood violence, gun violence, drug violence, um, childhood um, you know, risk factors, abuse, maltreatment. Um, so that was both amazing to me and sad. Um, and I, um, we started with Beck Bradley and Tanya Vodovich and others at Emory at the time, it's now grown for, for a couple of decades, um, looking at um, just cross-sectionally people coming into to, to the regular medical departments for, for general health care or OBGYN care or surgical care and just at doing surveys with them about, you know, what brings you in and then, you know, trauma histories and, and doing sort of screens for different disorders. And the take home message, now we've interviewed almost 13,000 people over the last 20 years from inner city Atlanta, is that our rates of PTSD in the inner cities is as high or higher than in our veterans. Um, people, um, it's on the order of 25 to 30%. And again, in the general population, it's more like eight to 10%. Um, and that's because simply of enormously high rates of, of trauma exposure over the lifetime of folks. So the Grady Trauma Project's really been about understanding that, putting voice to it, trying to put numbers to it, and then also trying to understand the biology from an imaging and genetics, et cetera. And that cohort became one of the core cohorts and it's actually the leading, um, the largest African-American cohort um, to understand psychiatric um, disorders, particularly PTSD. So that became one of the core cohorts of the Psychiatric Genomic Consortium PTSD Initiative. So one of the other things I've been involved in for a couple decades now is, is, the, is the Worldwide um, Genomics um, Initiative. And again, from twin studies, we've known for a long time that PTSD is part biological inheritable. And so about 30 to 40% of, based on twin studies, of, the, of whether you get PTSD or not is heritable. And that's hard for some for people to think about, I think, sometimes initially, because we just spend all this time saying that PTSD is something you get from the environment. But it's kind of like substance abuse. You have a certain risk of converting. Yeah. You know, not everybody who ha takes a drink or everybody who tries marijuana or other drugs of abuse becomes um, addicted to it or has a, a substance abuse or, or alcohol abuse problem. And that's, um, that's, that's true with most diseases, most yeah, major yeah. diseases. There is some you know, genetic component for risk. Yeah, exactly. So for us, then it became exciting because while almost everything in psychiatry has a nature versus nurture, a gene by environment interaction, very few other areas in psychiatry measure the environment as well as the PTSD literature does, because for the history yeah. of this field, it's been thought of as an environmental disorder. Yeah. So if we could if we could add the genetics, we could then maybe really understand gene by environment in a powerful way, whereas it's been harder with say schizophrenia to know how much is the prenatal stuff, how much is marijuana exposure, how much is other things, et cetera. So um, anyway, um, the the so the jump forward you know, 10 or 15 years with the Psychiatric Genomic Consortium that's now led by Car Caroline Nievergelt at UCSD with Kirsten Conan at Harvard, myself and Murray Steen, um, and a whole bunch of collaborators around the world. Um, we have over a million samples um, and um, over 80 um, um, very robust hits at a genome-wide significant level. So there's really starting to be a genetic architecture of PTSD ri risk. And again, if you never have trauma, that risk won't affect you. But if you have high rate risk genetically, then it may be a lesser trauma or less dosing of total trauma that converts you over to PTSD. And then the final component that I've been principally involved in is the longitudinal component. So we started, we I talked a little bit about, you don't get, we don't diagnose PTSD immediately, rather it's something that we diagnose a month out. Yeah, we don't really know much at all about the development of PTSD. Does it happen? How much is already existing risk and then the trauma happens and then basically they're just converted versus how much of it is people have, say, a, a deficit in ability to recover. Barbara Rothbaum's work from the 90s showed that people with rape um, who go on to have PTSD, it's not that they develop it slowly over time. They have symptoms. They just never really recover. 
um, and they aren't extinguishing that normal set of fear and threat processes. Um, or is there a sensitization process where people are more fine and get worse? And so the study called the Aurora study um, is a 20 site um, multi-site emergency department study funded by NIH and DOD with the goal of having the largest data set at the genomics, multiomics, digital phenotyping, wearable devices, imaging, basically as much biological phenotyping as we can, as well as um, you know, ecological momentary assessments or real world, world pro, um, data collection up to a year after trauma. Um, and so that data has really started to um, produce a lot of really interesting things as well. And it feels like we're only at the tip of the iceberg for what's gonna come out of that, finding new biomarkers, et cetera. And the long-term goal of all of this, um, you know, the genetics levels identifying targets and predictions, the, bio, the neuroimaging levels really understanding the circuits. And for me, the, the, the emergency department study, while it's important for understanding the development of trauma, the most exciting outcome is could we prevent it? It could be one of the few disorders in our field where we could truly prevent the disorder because we know when it starts. Yeah. And in the same way we have interventions in the emergency departments for stroke or heart attack, you have chest pain. If you get there within a certain number of hours and you have the right tests, you can prevent the long-term damage of a myocardial infarction. If we had either the psychotherapeutic or medication ways of blocking that initial fear memory consolidation, could we prevent the long-term effects of the trauma from ever developing into PTSD and instead just being a bad memory? So that's I, have, I have two questions. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned uh, early childhood trauma. So is it is mine? Is this what I'm going to say right? I guess. So someone who has early childhood trauma, say someone living in the inner city with where there's a lot of violence, for example, they're exposed to. Um, then later on in life, say when they're in their 30s and 40s, they're more. Are they more likely to develop PTSD with a subsequent trauma? Yes. So. Um... So the, probably the biggest risk factor for all psychiatric diseases that we know of is childhood trauma. And that's um, certainly is in PTSD and I'll talk more about that, but you know, there's also associations with childhood trauma and increased risk for depression and increased risk for bipolar and even to some extent for schizophrenia, certainly for substance abuse. Um, but with PTSD, definitely. Um, and both humans and animal studies show that developmental trauma seems to sensitize the threat circuit. So that then if you have a adult trauma on top of that, you're more likely to convert to PTSD following that adult trauma. Yeah. And then my second question was related to um, this period, you know, right after the trauma where there's a lot of potential for developing interventions to prevent the progression to PTSD. Does one's environment during that post-trauma period, for example, social support network and so on, affect one's risk of actually going on to develop PTSD. Yeah, it definitely seems to. Some of the best data so far of just sort of naturalistic studies are that um, that those who are most protected from trauma, you know, have a number of things, you know, have kind of Maslow's triad of, you know, they've got safety, they've got food, they've got shelter, they've got a social support network, they have communication, they know what's going on. So, you know, after a, a terrorist event or after a mass casualty, um, if they feel like they've got all of those support networks, they're not in a period of further ongoing stress, they're not in a period of further ongoing threat, and they have the support networks of safety um, and trust, those can be critical in, in, in recovery. Okay, so let's move on to what's actually happening in the brain. At, I guess the neural network activity level, which can be studied in both humans and animals. You want to talk about sure. what, brain, what brain regions are altered and involved? Sure. So we could dive deeply on different levels, but I'll start with kind of the top circuit um, that we talk about. Um, so when one experiences trauma, um, the, you know, the, the, the main players are the sensory systems that are encoding whatever's going on at the time as well as the pain systems that are often, or the, or the threat ex observational experiences that sort of activate the internal sense of, of, of death fear, <laughs> death threat, right? Those come together in a brain region called the amygdala that is, um, stands for, is, is Latin for almond, and it's about two centimeters inside the ears. Um, and um, that 
together with information coming from the hippocampus that we think is involved in the contextualization as well as the sensory cues, all of that together forms essentially the complement of the, of, the, of the conditioned stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus at the time. And Pavlov defined this as Pavlovian or classical conditioning. Um, and we think that what happens is that within a matter of minutes to hours to days, new memories are formed where now all the cues, be it the sound of a car, the sound of people screaming, the sound of a hawk, or you know, anything else you could have smells, whatever you could imagine as cues that are happening around time of trauma. Those now by themselves through, er, er, through synaptic plasticity and learning in the amygdala now become able to activate the threat and fear response, just as if the, the, the pain or trauma or car accident or attack had happened by themselves. And the amygdala is kind of the driver of that associative memory. Over time, the amygdala also seems to have feedback on the sensory systems and you see plasticity and enhanced sensitization in the visual system and the auditory system, our old olfactory system. Um, so that's kind of the main core. The amygdala is then able to activate what, what has been known now for decades because it hardwired projections from the amygdala to many subcortical and brainstem areas lead to the reflexive fear system of um, startle, of increased heart rate, of upset stomach, GI distress, of the parasympathetic and sympathetic alterations leading to the sweatiness, um, leading to the, the respiratory distress, to feeling like you can't catch your breath. So all of those physical symptoms of panic and threat and fear, as well as the increased blood pressure and kind of the increased, you know, muscle um, tone is all part of this reflex that's essentially you know, evolved since, since early rodents with us. Um, so that's the basic sort of sub, subcortical stuff. And then what's happening in humans? What's well, being regulated by other brain regions? So the prefrontal cortex in particular, the medial prefrontal cortex is kind of the top-down regulator when they also the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. So these higher evolved areas sort of are putting the brakes on the amygdala. Yeah. Um, as well as the hippocampus, which is providing safety context and other contexts. So in a healthy person, um, if you have, you know, are re-exposed to something that, that reminds you of a bad or something you're afraid of. If you're a snake and you see a stick and you think it's a snake, you're upset for a second, but then you calm down. Or if you, you know, were a car accident a few years ago, it's a bad memory, but you don't have PTSD. You see a hawk, you may jump for a second. Okay, and then you're fine again. And so it's the it's the prefrontal cortex and the hippocampus which are saying, okay, yes, the initial rapid cue came through the sensory system, activated the amygdala, but these other systems rapidly are saying, no, this is a safe context. This is not where this is not a real snake, or the snakes don't live here, or this is you're not in danger of a car. Let's calm the amygdala down, re re reestablish homeostasis, and go back to your business. People with PTSD, those systems aren't working. You're kind of stuck in a state of fear. Now, the, the hippocampus is, is you know, uh, it's very critical for short-term memories, right? And all these sensory systems you've been talking about uh, kind of funnel into the hippocampus. Uh, but then somehow these short-term memories have to be converted to like long-lasting memories. So I, two questions related to that. Does information from the sensory cortices cortexes, association cortexes, project, are there projections directly to the amygdala or are they coming through the hippocampus then to the amygdala? Yeah, so, so the simple answer is yes. There's, the amygdala probably receives more direct projections from more parts of the brain than almost any place, maybe okay. including the hippocampus, but, but okay. it, it gets a lot of direct. So the way we have to think about it is really multiple parallel memory systems. Um, and I think we're, we're kind of used to thinking about this a little bit with declarative memory versus, say, motor memory. So we know that riding a bike and learning how to ride a bike and then remembering how to ride a bike is not something you really can, you know, you can talk about it and try to teach it, but it's really your motors, your, your muscles do it. <laughs> and that's a very different thing than, you know, what is five plus five or where did I park my car? Yeah. More declarative memories and executive memories that are more hippocampal. Um, emotional memories are more amygdala and certainly the threat memories. And that's a parallel memory that's laid down. And, you know, I think part of why people struggle with it is because it feels like, because we have this experience, we can talk about it. We feel like we should have the same cognitive control over our emotional memories that we do our declarative memories. But, they're, but in fact, they're more like motor memories. There are these things that happen. They're happening below the surface. They're happening in parallel with what we're consciously aware of more in yeah. the Campbell space. Yeah. And they can be learned differently and differentially regulated. Yeah.
Um, so talk about consolidation. So we have the initial threat and you know short-term memory of that, and then somehow that memory has is starts to be recalled in kind of an uncontrolled manner. You wanna <laughs> Yeah, so there's several concepts there. So you know over the Lord both with, you know, initially with Pavlov and then a lot of the behaviorists and the, the um, people focusing on threat memories really through kind of the, the 60s through kind of the 90s did a lot of the work on identifying the different parts of memory. And we're still not trying to figure out how that works in humans compared to animals. But but the, basically, you know, initially um, when when you first have the the trauma experience or the fear, the pain experience, that that is the initial pairing of a conditioned stimulus i.e. a formally neutral thing, um, and the unconditioned stimulus, a pain thing, right? And then that, when those are paired, consolidation occurs. That's memory consolidation. And that can happen, it's, it's very rapid at a at sort of a channel level in, in, in neurons and synapses. But over the course of hours to days, you actually get new synapses. You get, we know that growth factors occur. We know that an MDA is important. We know that calcium dependent plasticity occurs. This happens in multiple brain regions, but it's definitely happening in the amygdala. And then over the course of um, even more days and weeks, you get new growth of axons, potentially even new cells in some places. Um, and that sort of is laying down this long-term memory. As you mentioned earlier, consolidation of memories in the hippocampal and executive memories, we know is both initially short-term memories in the hippocampus and then long-term memories that sort of gets distributed through multiple sensory systems and associative networks. The amygdala threat network is less clear. It's both distributed, but it seems that the amygdala continues to play a part both in the initial learning of the memory and the expression of the memory over time. So it is kind of central both in their narrowly consolidation and in the longer term expression of memory. Once a memory has been created to be afraid, um, and now it's a fear memory, then um, what can happen if it's re, if it's reactivated, and then a couple different things can happen. If you now re-experience the tone or the the smell or the the cues that activate the memory, if you experience them over and over again, but the bad things not happening, okay. um, that we call extinction. You essentially relearn that the the, the CS no longer predicts the, the unconditioned stimulus, and that's essentially what we think happens in exposure-based psychotherapy, which is our main treatments for PTSD. People talk about or we are exposed to the cues that normally trigger them, but they do it in a way that has a lot of psychoeducation, a lot of support, emotional support. And essentially, we learn that this is just an internal memory. It's not, the, it's not the real thing. And so over time, those cues don't activate that reflexive fear. Um, and, and probably the prefrontal cortex plays an important role in that. Exactly. So the prefrontal cortex and hippocampus are both critical for that. The hippocampus both is laying down. So, so what was shown by um, Rescorla and, and Mark Bouton and Mike Davis and others in the 60s and 70s was extinction isn't an erasure of the original memory. It's a, re, it's a new learning of a new safety memory. And the hippocampus is, is providing the context of in these places, this is safe. And the prefrontal cortex is helping to dissociate what is safe and what is not. And let's activate plasticity so that all of that together can relearn that this is a new safe thing. And for a long time, we thought that extinction was the main, that either animals extinguish or they don't. Um, and then, but what was always seen clinically was that this concept of maybe sensitization. People would say, Doc, every time I talk about it, it seems to get worse. And, you know, you definitely have some people who in therapy weren't necessarily getting better, um, or they were sort of, they were, it seemed like one thing after another, and they would just get more and more and more upset and more sensitized. Hmm. Um, and a concept that had been shown with ECT in the 60s and then was sort of rediscovered in the early 90s by Kareem Nader and Joe Ledoux was called reconsolidation. And the idea there was if you activate a memory that, a fear memory that was previously um, just, you know, a fear memory, but you don't, instead of having a long-term exposure to it, where you start to activate this extinction process, you instead have a short exposure, the memory becomes active and can actually be re-strengthened. And what was particularly exciting there was not only that it could be re-strengthened, but that it would go through a period of, 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 of lability where maybe even those, the, the main synapse, the main memory trace was actually vulnerable. Again. So a lot's been going on trying to understand, can, is that vulnerability providing potentially a way you could interfere with or erase the original memory as opposed to simply extinguish over time and relearn safety? 
That remains clinically not so clear, but it does provide an explanation for what the sensitization process is. So you mentioned ECT, electroconvulsive shock, which uh, it's still used for depression, major depression in patients that don't respond well to drugs. Um, and But it, it's not completely clear how it's having these beneficial effects, right? I mean, it's you're essentially causing almost mild seizure like yeah no it actually is a it's a full it's actually a pretty full seizure yeah um that to some extent is generalized but because people are under, under anesthesia they don't have the physical movements yeah but um yeah i mean so you know i think it cons consists pretty clear that the con the the factor that is holds across everything we know about treating depression is enhancing plasticity yeah and that causing seizures increase plasticity and you know if you in animals, if you give them a seizure and look at any neuroplasticity gene, everything from brain-derived neurotrophic factor to any other growth factor to NMDA receptors and others, you get a huge change in gene expression after a seizure. Um, and But it's just happening at the whole brain. We think ketamine is kind of doing the same thing, you know, that's now used to sort of rapidly enhance plasticity. And most of the data on most of our antidepressants suggest that over time, while you start with hitting the monoamine systems like serotonin, over time, they're increasing growth factor, it's like brain-derived neurotrophic factor. Yeah. And actually, BDNF, uh, I think, if I recollect, was discovered in, in an animal model of seizures. Mm -hmm. uh, with, chemically induced seizures. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Ron Duman did it, the late Ron Duman yeah. did a lot of the work in that area, yeah. And, and yeah, BDNF, there's strong associations with uh, antidepressant effects, not only of ECT, but also some of the serotonin, norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors and so mm -hmm. on. And this protein, uh, it's known to enhance synapse formation and and neural resilience, which is actually something we study in my lab quite a bit. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the vulnerability of in, individual neurons to various types of stress. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. So, so just to just sort of wrap up that part of the yeah. conversation. So I think we can think about seizures doing a lot of different things. And the way we use them right now for depression is again, to activate plasticity and recovery. What I was thinking of was more the other effect of seizures, which we also know they cause, cause short-term amnesia. <laughs> and so oh. the, the, some of the original work with reconsolidation showed that if you reactivate a memory briefly and then do a seizure for short-term amnesia, you could potentially significantly decrease the memory of that, oh. that old memory. And so that was some of the data that if you, if you reactivate the memory trace and in the right yes. window, do something to cause amnesia, be it a seizure or be it a protein synthesis inhibitor or other plasticity event, you could block it. So that's part of sort of the current idea that anytime a memory trace is reactivated, it can either be re-strengthened re and resensitized, but partly through plasticity, which might be amenable to manipulation, or that other processes, including the prefrontal cortex and the hippocampus, can start to say, no, these things aren't associated anymore, and let's learn, you know, learning safety or learning the, the disconnection. Now, you're doing a lot of work uh, trying to uh, essentially identify predictors, uh, biological predictors of whether someone will uh, develop PTSD after a trauma. Can you talk about your biomarker work? And lot, you've done a lot of work on brain imaging showing these really nice um, uh, indicators of one's risk. Yeah, so, um, you know, a lot of it's still pretty early, but, you know, what we've been able to show in several different cohorts is within the, so starting with the brain activity, that, um, that we know if you have chronic PTSD, that you're more likely to a fearful cue have increased amygdala activation, um, and at least in some cohorts have decreased prefrontal and decreased hippocampal activation. Mm -hmm. And our data has shown that within two weeks after the trauma, um, which is long before you can formally diagnose PTSD, that people's amygdala activation in a positive correlation or hippocampal activation in a negative correlation can predict PTSD symptoms six months or 12 months later. So that if the amygdala is overactive to threatening cues early in the first days and weeks after trauma, that person is more likely to go and develop chronic PTSD. And if the hippocampus is underactive, again, not providing that other contextual and safety information to um, hippocampal act 
probes in the scanner, then you're also more likely to develop PTSD. So, so those are two of the more robust findings predictive wise. And then um, in the large scale multi imaging groups with Enigma, they've also replicated some of Doug Bremner's early findings that hippocampal volumes associated with increased PTSD, such that smaller hippocampal volume associated with childhood trauma and chronic stress is also associated with increased PTSD consistent with that functional finding that less hippocampal activities associated with PTSD. Yeah, I know in, in studies of depression that was shown that uh, hippocampal size is decreased in major depressive disorder. And then there are at least a few studies where they reported that, you know, after treatment and recovery, the size of the hippocampus actually increased. So there seems, you know, the brain has potential to recover uh, structurally and functionally uh, in, in both depression and, and maybe PTSD. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think the, yeah, I mean, okay. everything has caveats, but yes, I think, that, I think that's, the, that's the take home message for sure. Um, and then I think some of the other biomarkers, um, again, the polygenic risk scores, we, we don't have large enough sample sizes. Basically with the genetics, with the common variant genetic data, that will probably never be robust enough to predict at an individual level, but it yeah. can predict at a, at a population level. And so, the genetic polygenic risk is associated with increased PTSD. If you, you know, if you if you have more carrier variants, um, and then um, some inflammation markers in the early aftermath of trauma are associated with PTSD, um, and and decreased um, heart rate variability and in, increased um, sympathetic activity measured both with galvanic skin oh. response huh. and with heart rate variability. So those autonomic nervous system measures are also associated with increased PTSD. So heart rate variability goes down? Yep. Yeah. Yep. So sympathetic um, response goes up yeah. measured with galvanic skin response in the emergency room. That's associated with later PTSD and less heart rate variability in the days and weeks after trauma um, associated with parasympathetic response is associated with PTSD. Now, so now most things are going about, in the predicted direction. <laughs> when I think about heart rate and heart rate variability, I think about exercise. Um, it's well well established, you know, people, particularly if they're doing regular aerobic exercise, will have lower resting heart rate and higher heart rate variability. So they have kind of the opposite the PTSD. They have enhanced parasympathetic tone and, and maybe decreased sympathetic. Is there evidence that exercise is a potential benefit to People with PTSD. There, there's some preclinical evidence that exercise is associated with more rapid extinction, and I think there's some correlational studies in PTSD that exercise is associated with better recovery and fewer symptoms. I think the I think a truism is that that cardiovascular health and physical exercise are good for almost everything in psychiatry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I don't think PTSD is any different there. Yeah. Right. So. You talk quite a bit about amygdala and, and the changes occurring there and, and hippocampus as well. What about other brain regions? I, it was interesting. I was looking at some of your work uh, and others, or maybe it was one of your talks, where people were looking at are there changes in the sensory cortex? So going back to the, the beginning of our conversation with the odor and fear, are there actual structural changes in the olfactory system? If, if it's an olfactory stimulus that's giving the threat response, what about auditory system? What about visual system? Yeah, so that has continued to develop in really interesting ways. So, you know, plasticity of the sensory systems goes way back. I and mean, if we think about people like Mike Stryker um, and uh, Michael Mersnick um, in the auditory and visual systems and, um, and um, John Cass in the auditory and others in the, you know, there's a lot of different models in different species from, you know, really the 70s to the 90s that if you significantly alter um, the input to a sensory system, you could get alteration in the structural representation in the sensory system. Yeah. And initially that started with development of things like hubal and weasel and ocular dominance and blocking one eye, but it was shown that with enough 
sensory deprivation or sensory alteration, even in adults, you could get changes in those systems. So, um, so that was always very interesting to me. And so um, I had done my graduate work in the olfactory system. And so one of the th things we did relatively early in my lab was ask if we do this olfactory training to one odor versus another, could we see any structural changes in the olfactory part of the brain, the olfactory bulb related to that fear conditioning? Because every other sensory system, because they're mapped like in a retinotopic map or a tonotopic map, you can't really separate out cues. But in the olfactory system where each odor has specific combinations of glomeruli, the idea is we could, you could have an internal control for some odors versus others and see if there were changes. And sure enough, we showed it and it's been, now been replicated many times by multiple labs that you see with, if you do olfactory fear conditioning in an adult mouse, you see increased representation of the neurons in the nose, now, number of neurons in the nose, and partly the unique thing about the olfactory system is that the, the number of neurons are turning over regularly throughout yeah. life. Yeah. So you end up having more neurons representing that odor and a larger glomeruli representing that odor. So you have increased sensitivity to the odor. Um, and, and it's still being debated what causes that. Is it, is, it, is it being, is it our hypothesis? We know that if you do fear conditioning back to BDNF, you get more BDNF release in the area of the olfactory bulb for that specific odor. So we think it is prolonged survival of odor of the odor receptor neurons that are specific for that odor versus another one. But there's some evidence that it may be increased neurogenesis of one type of odor receptor molecule versus another. But happy to talk more. Yeah, more recent. It's, it's also interesting been shown how that, that the olfactory system and the hippocampus are the two brain regions where it's clear there's stem cells that are constantly giving rise to new neurons, and those are very ancient some of the most ancient parts of the brain, um, they, I guess, evolved with this, the stem cell pools. And then when the rest of the brain developed, for whatever reason, <laughs> it doesn't have the capability of, of producing new neurons. It's yeah, no, that's, um, that's beyond my ability to talk about, but it's great. Yeah, yeah, I know. It's a very I'm, interesting observation for sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, and just one other thing on that, um, you know, so just to, to sort of round out that part of the discussion. Uh, so we and, and others have now shown that olfactory conditioning also leads to plasticity and some level of structural change in the in the in the auditory system if it's an odor, if it's a tone cue. Um, and in humans, there's now evidence from multiple studies that, and again, most of you know, humans are a very, very visual animal. And most of the traumas we see in emergency departments are, are car accidents. And there's a lot of visual stuff happening there. And we see increased visual um, gray matter volume and increase in the, in, the, in the visual cortex, as well as increased um, functional activity in the visual cortex associated with greater PTSD and associated with more nightmares and intrusions. So again, it seems to be holding up across species and across sensory systems. Okay. Let's, uh, we'll get to potential current treatments and, and what's on the horizon in the future. First, let's, what about, we haven't really talked at all about neurotransmitters. Now, in our brains, most of the neurons, about 90% use glutamate as a neurotransmitter. The next most abundant neurons are use GABA, the inhibitory, and that's kind of the core circuitry. So all these circuits we've been talking about are mainly excitatory glutamatergic neurons and then that are projecting, you know, connecting prefrontal with amygdala or hippocampus and so on, and then GABA. And then these other transmitters, which most people kind of in the lay public may have heard about more than glutamate and GABA, are, you know, serotonin or dopamine. The only way, the only way they affect behavior is by modifying the ongoing activity of these glutamatergic neurons. You have any comments on the circuitry? Because this, when we get to treatments, uh, this becomes, can become important. Yeah, so um, it's, so there's a lot there. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, in terms of glutamate and GABA, um, so most of the cortical and hippocampal projections are glutamatergic. Um, the central amygdala, interestingly, is, is almost all GABA. So it seems to have a inverse sign that's compl that complicates things a little bit. <laughs> um, I think at the, at the whole brain level, um, 
if you use things like magnetic resonance spectroscopy, where you can actually measure glutamate levels and get GABA levels in the brain, there's some evidence that a majority of stress-related syndromes, be they depression or PTSD, um, have, are associated with more cortical glutamate and less GABA, and that's consistent with the idea that there's sort of less inhibitory tone, um, and that fits with some of the um, sort of TMS and other neuro, neurotherapeutic approach, direct neurotherapeutic yeah. approaches. Um, and there's some evidence that with ECT that we talked about earlier, that that over, while initially causing this excitatory seizure, leads to sort of a rebound enhancement of inhibitory tone. So that's sort of one set of, of findings. Again, the monoamine system, serotonin, norepinephrine, dopamine, um, are all primarily in these circuits about modulating things. Yeah. They're not really the fast neurotransmitters, but they're modulating the neurotransmitters. And um, again, our, our best current pharmacotherapies for PTSD are the same as for depression and anxiety. Um, there are only FDA approved drugs are paroxetine and sertraline. Um, and you really treat them as you're treating the other anxiety disorders with, with sort of a, low, a, a slow taper or titration of SSRIs and SNRIs. The, um, the, the only drug that is more precise than that, that is particularly interesting, gets back to the idea of the sympathetic hyperarousal, arousal, and that's prazosin, which is an alpha antagonist of the adrenergic system. And that's mm -hmm. actually, so both prazosin as an alpha antagonist and clonidine as an alpha two agonist, which essentially do the same thing. One is, one is blocking the next, the downstream receptors of the noradrenergic epinephrine system. Um, and the other one is blocking the autoreceptors or enhancing the autoreceptors, which does the same thing with decreased brain. Both of those decrease sympathetic arousal, and those seem to help with some of the arousal components of PTSD as well as the nightmares. And then Excellent. there's a lot of neuropeptides and other things that we probably don't want to go into, but where a lot of the future excitement is, I think. So the mainline therapy mm -hmm. are number one, the the actual therapy uh, to enhance extinction of the memories, the desensitization. Right. The trauma-based ex trauma based psychotherapy. That's like number based one. On exposure and extinction, that's right. And then second is some of these drugs that are used for anxiety and depression already. Right. Okay. And um, what else in the treatment aspect? I had a podcast with um, Franz Vollenweider, he's, I don't know if you've come across him. He's a, his name, I've not met him. He's a psychiatrist in, uh, he's in Zurich now. But he was like at the epicenter of the psychedelic um, research because uh, it happened there with, with Hoffman who synthesized both LSD and psilocybin. And at Johns Hopkins here, where I'm at, they just started, actually started a center for psychedelic research, and, uh, Roland Griffiths. And essentially, there have been multiple studies now suggesting in a, in a clinical setting, you know, under the right conditions, uh, beneficial effects of psychedelics in major depression. What, is there any efforts to are there clinical trials going on with that approach now? With PTSD? With psychedelics? Yeah. Um, so there have been a few with PTSD that have had very strong effect sizes and look very promising. I think the, the caveat for all the psychedelic research is that it's pretty much impossible to control it because having a, a, a sham or, via, or placebo um, ah. for, for something that is very you know, psychotropically active is a complex mm. thing. So mm. that's kind of where the struggle is in the field right now. Um, that said, you know, the things that have been done, the, the studies that have gotten a lot of attention have had these sort of very long um, in-person sort of coached right. psychotherapy sessions um, right. that are kind of done in different ways. And the people with more of the psychedelic bent talk about, you know, kind of the transformative um, you know, re you know, experience that sort of changes one's sort of existential understanding and, and changes, which all may be true. Um, there's, um, but I think it's a very hard thing to study. Um, and what we also don't know is there's been very few studies where, you know, we know from the concept of exposure therapy that flooding, you know, if, you, if done right, can be very powerful and you can have very rapid effects across different kinds of anxiety disorders and OCD and phobias with having a lot of exposure in one setting. 
Um, so I think, you know, if, if you see it from that perspective, it's not, it's not that of an unexpected idea. So, so with the flooding, how, how is that done in practice? Um, the easiest example is like with like phobias. So like if you have a spider phobia, um, instead of say coming to a 30 or 40 minute, you know, session, you know, for 10 weeks in a row, you might have one five or six hour day. And you would start by talking about the spider, seeing pictures of spiders, starting with the spider across the room, and then kind of working closer and closer. And by the end of the day, you're holding the spider for an hour, right? So <laughs> you're sort of, it's, this is an enormous amount of exposure to the, to the threatening cue with a, a, an enormous amount of negative data that this is not going to hurt you all in one setting, all with the coaching, all of that. So and then, and hopefully, we'll, hopefully the spider won't. Well, yeah, exactly. So you hopefully do they don't get bit, bit by the spider during the <laughs> You gotta make sure they're wearing proper gloves or whatever, but yeah, <laughs> but yeah, it's exactly. So, um, you know, and I think, but that all kind of also does kind of raise, you know, a little bit facetiously, but you know, the, one of the other concerns is that as this gets more unregulated, people are going to have bad trips and some people are going to have bad experiences. Sure. And then is that, you know, is that going to be as bad for them as people who have a good experience is good for them. Right. Um, yeah. But I think, I think the most, interesting way of thinking about the psychedelic story is that it's really serotonergic mediated rapid plasticity yeah. so in the same way the ketamine is rapid glutamatergic plasticity is the are the psychedelics that are hitting the, the 5-ht systems leading to a rapid plasticity that is where our antidepressants get us eventually but they get us there very quickly and yeah. if we combine that with this kind of flooding supportive psychotherapy experience yeah. is that so so it's exciting it's very hard to study and i'm a little worried for the field that there's more money and excitement behind it than there is data, but yeah. we'll see where it goes. <laughs> yeah, and the, you know, the decriminalization is, with that seems to be moving forward. And, you know, I think you're right. It's, uh, there's pot clearly potential dangers of that. Uh, what else for, as far as treatments on the horizon? So, you know, before all of those things, um, you know, where I did think there was quite a bit of excitement, and I still think there's excitement, is other ways of enhancing plasticity, but in a more well-controlled way that don't have all the, the psychomimetic experiences, right? So a drug called decycloserine is known to enhance glutamate and enhance plasticity. And in different ways, that was associated with improved therapy responses. Um, and ketamine is being looked at, you know, with psychotherapy. So I think, I think if we can identify ways to enhance plasticity in a controlled fashion and combine that with exposure therapy that's really targeting the memory traces, you know, that seems to be where some of the most exciting future benefits, particularly for PTSD are. And also thinking about using things like transcranial magnetic simulation targeting specific circuits may also be helpful. Yeah, that's a really interesting technology that has it's really been advanced a lot in terms of being able using this transcranial magnetic stimulation to to either increase or decrease activity in specific brain regions that seems in theory to have a lot of potential you know you could uh, whatever i don't know you know decrease activity in the amygdala increase activity in prefrontal cortex or hippocampus and maybe do do that during an exposure, you know, combining it with therapy, there seems to be a lot of, now I don't know how, you know, I'm not a clinician, how common it is for places to have the equipment for TMS. It, it's not, it's not widely available. Right. No, I mean, it's, it's, it's growing. Um, I think part of the issue is we still have so much to learn, you know, I mean, for the most part, most people are still using the same targets that we use for depression, um, which is essentially, you know, two centimeters in front of the motor cortex. Um, but um, there's a lot of evidence that A, people have slightly different brain anatomy and, <laughs> and at the same spot, you know, for two people may not be the same. And so some of the exciting areas are where you can combine neuroimaging with TMS to really have much more precision in which, my, in which you know, sub-circuit you're hitting. Um, and then I think our understanding of how this works with circuitry is still relatively early on. And people like um, Connor Liston at, um, at, in, at um, Cornell and I mean, at Ken at Stanford and others have done some really interesting work on how these different circuits work. And so I think we'll, there'll be new generations of TMS that are much more precise. Um, you know, one example, I was involved in a TMS study in which we were trying to target the part of the prefrontal cortex 
that um, enhances extinction what with written exposure therapy. So it's a brief form of exposure. And in fact, in that study, the people who got the active treatment did worse than the people who got the sham because we think we were activating more of the, door, of the anterior cingulate, which is more associated with increased fear than we were the pre-genual, which is associated with decreased fear. <laughs> okay. So again, we have, have a long way to go in understanding. Not a lot of work, a lot of work to do. Yeah. yeah, exactly. I think one other kind of neat thing um, that's out there um, is a group um, um, in Israel led by Talma Hindler has shown that you can do EEG driven um, trend. So basically the problem with, so there's a lot of excitement about biofeed, neural biofeedback. You know, the old idea of biofeedback is, you know, you're basically just looking at galvanic skin response and looking at sympathetic activation. Hmm. But now it's, can you use imaging based biofeedback? And, and some people have shown some really nice proof of concept that if you can downregulate amygdala activity in a scanner, people will have sort of an anxiolytic effect. And when you train people how to do that, um, huh. it can be a much more powerful kind of you know, mindfulness or treatment huh. as sort of a self biofeedback level. The problem is doing that in a scanner is hard and very few places, it would, it's never be scalable. What they showed is you could take EEG that normally only gets top cortical activity, but using machine learning, you can combine EEG and imaging and train the EEG for the signals that actually represent amygdala activity, even though you're not directly measuring the amygdala activity. And okay. then they get that, they can then have a scalable EEG biofeedback, but that's trained on amygdala activity. And they showed um, some nice um, proof of concept that you can decrease stress and fear and are about to do a clinical PTSD trial. Um, wow, that's, 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 that's really trial. intriguing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now, um, I'll... There, there's some area we didn't cover getting into the molecular level and the specific genes. You've done a lot of work trying to identify genes uh, that are involved and in, in, in the function of the proteins and how they may modulate. But I think what we'll do in, in, in uh, consideration of time is I will uh, refer people to some of your lectures, which can be found on YouTube, your scientific mm -hmm. lectures. And I'll put links to those uh, on the YouTube channel and for those listening to the audio on Spotify and elsewhere, uh, go to YouTube and put in Kerry Ressler and you'll, you'll get some of the scientific lectures if you're interested in more of the details on what we've talked about and particularly getting down to the nitty gritty of what's going on in the cells and the genes and so on. Um, so, Carrie, I've enjoyed talking to you. I learned a lot. And um, what's clear is that there's actually been a lot of progress in, in research on PTSD, which is in contrast to many other neurological disorders in, in many ways. I've done a lot of work uh, on Alzheimer's, Parkinson's disease, where there's been very little progress in, in trying to figure out how to uh, slow the progression or reverse the, the disease process. In the case of PTSD, it looks like there's a lot of promise, which I think should be encouraging for, for many people. Uh, people with PTSD, people, you know, family members, and so on. So, um, yeah, I absolutely agree. And I was just sort of in with, you know, if you're, if you're seeking help, there are pretty good treatments already. Make sure you reach out to help. Um, and I think the future is quite bright and that the intersection of neuroscience and genetics, um, along with our clinical understanding of PTSD, is really expanding very rapidly. And I think it won't be that long before we have really novel and powerful you know, neuroscience-driven treatments and possibly even interventions or preventions um, in the aftermath of trauma. So, so stay tuned um, and thanks so much for your interest. Thanks, Carrie. Have a good rest of the summer. Thanks so much, Mark. Bye.